Welcome everybody. We're so excited for everybody to join us in our resurrection service. This is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Let me go ahead and encourage you right now to begin to share with as many people as you can. This is the most important service of the year. We've never done it like this before, but we are going to make a collective statement together for Jesus Christ. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to open up with some worship. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your divine presence, Lord God, that's already moving. I thank you, Lord God, for what you're going to do through this service. I pray for every person, Lord God, that's streaming, that's watching, and that is connected to this service this afternoon. I am asking God for you to visit them with your supernatural demonstration during this milestone of celebration, Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together right where you are at. Let's lift up Jesus.
blood that gives me all of my strength from day to day and it will never lose I said it can never lose thank God it can never lose it's right where you are at let's just go ahead and praise the Lord together right now God we thank you for the blood we thank you for the blood we thank you Lord for this celebration this afternoon there is no one like you there is no one that can do what only you can do we lift you up in this house right now in the name of Jesus go ahead right where you are at just begin to lift up Jesus. This is a celebration service. This is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no reason to be silent. This is every reason to celebrate and to raise your voice. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh, hallelujah. We exalt you, great King. We exalt you, great King. Praise God. Praise God. I am wanting you today to seek the Lord. I want you to seek the Lord that you can see the Lord. Because I know if you can see the Lord, you'll be able to celebrate. In the midst of what seems like an impossibility, you're going to be able to celebrate. Because there is a king that shines down. And there is power that is available to us today. God is in control. I'm wanting you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John chapter number 20, please. I have a very special message for us today in this Easter celebration. And God is going to speak to you today. He has a word for you today. He has not forgotten about you and you are not left in the dark. Today is a brand new day and it is a day where revelation knowledge is going to meet you. And it's going to encourage you. Revelation chapter number 20, please. Verse number 15. And we're going to read down through verse number 22. Jesus said unto her, woman. Now this is Mary Magdalene. What happened? Jesus got up early in the morning, Sunday. He gets up and defeats the grave. And when he gets out of the grave... Mary Magdalene and the Marys were with her. And they came to see Jesus. You see, they didn't know if Jesus was going to be there. But they were seeking after Jesus. And because they were there seeking after Jesus, they were going to see Jesus. Uh, Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepeth thou? Whom seeketh thou? She, supposing him to be a gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou have bore him hence, or if you, if you have put the body away, is what she's saying, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, and Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go and tell my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, she sees him in the morning. But at evening time, Jesus is coming to his apostles. They're in a room and they're locked up. They don't know what the outcome is going to be. And Jesus does not hesitate to knock on the door. Jesus walks through the door because Jesus is the door. Glory to God. 
Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the door was shut where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now that word peace would be a word, if we looked at it in the Hebrew, it's where we would get shalom. So he's telling them shalom, which means peace or wholeness be unto you. And when he had said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. I want you to take notice of that. Jesus walks into the room. He tells them, peace be unto you. After he speaks the word peace, he immediately directs them to his hands where they drove nails in his hands, and he shows them his side, where the Roman centurion pierced his side. And then he repeats it one more time to them. Peace be unto you. And when he had thus said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I want to take a few moments here in this incredible celebration today. And I'm hoping that you're feeling the Holy Ghost even right there in your living room or in your kitchen or wherever you may be. Because I'm going to talk to us today about the perfect sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord God, that we are able to assemble together in body through the Spirit. I'm asking for every person that's tuned in and watching right now. I'm asking for your presence to begin to rest upon them. I'm asking for hearts to be open and that you would minister to us the revelation and the truths of your word. I'm stepping back. You step forward, Lord. For I declare all of you and none of me and that the devil is defeated in Jesus' name. Go ahead and say amen. Praise God. The perfect sacrifice. When you consider perfection, it doesn't take long for us to begin to wonder where we are going to find it because there's not a lot of things in life that we can look at and say that it is perfect. Even if you begin to consider craftsmanship, or if you begin to consider maybe uh, someone that works with wood, an individual would first have to cut down a tree and prepare the tree to begin to treat that tree to try to bring it to a state of perfection. And so what they would begin to do after they cut the tree and plane the tree, they would begin to sand the tree. They would begin to sand the tree in attempt to somehow get rid of all of the imperfections. Then after they sand the tree or the piece of wood, they would begin to take some stain and they would begin to stain that piece of wood. Because the craftsman, the designer is after bringing a sense of perfection to that piece of wood, such as a table or a chest. And so after they would sand it and after they would stain it, they would go ahead and begin to treat it with a sense of polyurethane. And after they seal it and after they've done all the work where they cut it down, they sanded it, they stained it, and they polyurethaned it. And after they would look at it, they would look at it and say, it's a beautiful piece, but they cannot look at that piece of wood. They cannot look at that table or that chest and say that it is perfect. They can bring it as close as they can to perfection, but they know that it is not perfect. Because if they would peer close to that piece of wood, 
they would begin to see the different knots in that wood. They would begin to see the different markings in that wood, revealing that it is not perfect. Because in life, we cannot find things that are perfect. Not even if you look at uh, our children in the sense to say that they are flawless. We love them. We adore them. And they're born and, and in that state, we can appreciate them and say they're perfect. But as they begin to grow and as they begin to develop, as they begin to get one, two years old, all of a sudden you begin to see the imperfections of life, the imperfection of a fallen nature begin to bleed through children. And of course, as we get older and we try to improve our lives ourselves and we strive to live the best that we can, and of course, the goal would be to be perfect, but within ourselves, we fall so short of being perfect. And truth be told, everyone is flawed in one way or another, and everyone is imperfect in one way or another. And this is why we have a reason to celebrate today Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the only one that is perfect. And because Jesus was perfect, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And today, if you could really open up your heart and begin to seek Him in a way where you desire to see Him. Because you can never see Him if you don't seek Him. But if you can begin to see Him today... And all of his perfection, once you see him, you'll begin to celebrate him. Go ahead and say praise the Lord to that right there. Matter of fact, why don't we go ahead and clap our hands unto the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our perfect sacrifice. Now, I want us to begin to look at some things in the scriptures here. I want to begin to reveal to us some insights, because Whatever we don't know, what has been invested to us, it has the potential to place us in a state of captivity. I know we have been touched and our lives have been disruptive and some of us feel very confined and restricted, but I want you to know that we are not in a state of captivity. We have been liberated because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Go with me to the book of Isaiah chapter number 5, verse number 13. God says, therefore my people are gone into captivity. They're gone into a state of bondage. Why, Isaiah? Why are God's people bound? Why are they limited? Why are they restricted? Because they have no knowledge. He says, because they lack the revelation to understand what has been invested in the earth and what has been invested in the church because they lack the revelation they're living in captivity. So it is my responsibility today, it is my assignment today to reveal to you some of the things that has happened with our perfect sacrifice. And as we begin to look into this perfect sacrifice, you can understand that he has translated his perfect sacrifice upon the church. And every person that lives within the body of Christ, every person that lives within the blood of Jesus Christ, God looks at you how he looks at Jesus. That's a good place to say amen right there. We're going to look at this here because this is what happened with Jesus you have to understand the Bible says in John chapter 1 verse number 29 that when John the Baptist looked at Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Yes, Jesus was a man in every way, but you have to understand that Jesus was born to be the sacrifice for the sins of fallen man. And so Jesus had a very unique assignment his responsibility was that he had to 
defeat the law by submitting to the law. He had to live a perfect life, a flawless life. So Jesus had to control every decision that he would ever make. Jesus had to control his thoughts, every thought that he would ever have. Jesus would have to bring every thought unto the submission of God. Jesus would have to bring every decision unto the submission of God. Jesus had to dot the law, dot the I of the law and cross the T of the law. He had to complete all of it. And because Jesus was perfect in completing the law, and because Jesus never committed a sin, he never committed a trespass, and because Jesus stayed on course, he never got off course. He stayed in perfect union with his Heavenly Father. Praise God. He stayed in absolute connection with his Heavenly Father. And because he stayed in absolute connection with his Heavenly Father, and he was submitted unto him, Jesus was perfect. He was so perfect, he completed the law. He says, I didn't come to do away with the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. Jesus is the only one that has ever fulfilled the law. And because he fulfilled that law, and because he lived this perfect life, Jesus was able to present himself as that sacrifice that would die on the cross. And that's exactly what happened on the day of the Passover. Jesus was going to be crucified. And Jesus being crucified was the expression of Jesus being sacrificed for the sins of the world. And God was in control of the whole thing. It seemed like such a harsh and cruel situation that Jesus was in. Think about it. Here Jesus is, the Son of God. And God is having His own Son go to a cross. God is having His own Son to be beaten. God is having His own Son to be bruised. God is having His own Son to be broken. It appears as if something was out of order here. And if you would stop at half the story, you could come to that conclusion. But if you understand the whole story, that Jesus came to give his life, that Jesus came to be that propitiation for our sins, and therefore Jesus surrendered himself to his heavenly Father, he went willingly to go to the cross. Praise God. He went willingly to go to the cross because he knew when he was going to the cross that he was taking your place and he was taking my place. Jesus knew that when he was carrying the cross that he was bearing the burdens of all the sins that would take place, all the sins of the past, all the sins of the present. And all the sins of the future. Jesus knew that he was bearing all of that. And so when he goes to the cross. It was very important. Very significant. That the high priest. Be involved with Jesus going to the cross. If you would remember and you reading your Bible. You would notice that the high priest. Came together at night. That when Pilate sent out the centurion to go and retrieve Jesus from the garden, they brought Jesus to and before the high priest. And they began to, to perform this kangaroo court system where they began to make false accusations against Jesus. And they began to declare that Jesus was guilty and that Jesus was in violation. They began to say that Jesus sinned. And, and all of these accusations were being, were being hurled at Jesus. And finally the high priest declared, he must die and he must be sacrificed. And you see, you have to understand because he had to contribute and declare Jesus as the Lamb of God that was going to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. If the high priest did not declare it, then Jesus' Jesus's investment would not have been a sacrifice. It would have been a spill. Ha! But God was in control 
of that moment. God was in control of that night. That everything that Jesus was going through, God was in control of it. Even the high priest, when he declared that he should die and that he was going to be sacrificed, what the high priest did not know, that Jesus was that Passover lamb and that his life was perfect. And because he had a perfect life, he had perfect blood. And because he had perfect blood, he qualified to shed his blood for the sins of the entire world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. Come on, thank the Lord right now for the blood. We thank the Lord for the blood. Pastor, why did they need to be blood? Because when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they sinned and they fell, the moment that they fell, sin separated them from God. And what God did, God took a lamb in the Old Testament. He shed that lamb. He took the skins of that lamb. He covered the flesh of Adam and Eve. And not only did he cover them with the skins, he took the blood and he allowed that blood to be an atonement to cover their sins and to cover their trespasses but God did not want to cover that blood for a season God wanted to eradicate that blood as far as the east is from the west he wanted that blood to, to eradicate the sins that were on mankind this is why in our text that we read, when Mary Magdalene came and she saw Jesus, the first thing that she did, she, mistake, she mistaken him to be a gardener. Why did she think he was a gardener? Because the Bible is pointing us all the way back to the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were at. She, Jesus was going all the way back to that garden because Jesus was that eternal lamb, that eternal sacrifice that was, was perfect in all of his ways, designed to give his life for the sins of the world. When you think about that, you think about him dying on that cross. And more specifically, you think about when Jesus got up early that Sunday morning, defeating death, hell, and the grave. Once Jesus got out of that grave and he stepped out, Jesus was going to go up to his heavenly father and he was going to present himself as a perfect sacrifice. But there was an interruption the Marys got together, and they came seeking after Jesus. And here they don't recognize it as Jesus. And Mary Magdalene was so desperate because she was seeking Jesus. You see, her seeking of Jesus was an act of worship for Jesus. And any time you begin to worship Jesus, you draw a personal presentation from God. She got a personal audience with Jesus. Mary Magdalene, if you will, she was disrupting and causing there to be a pause, if you will, with Jesus going to sacrifice himself. She saw him and she says, hey, tell me, where have you placed him? Where, where is he at? I'll go and retrieve him. He's valuable to me. He's valued to me, valuable to me alive and he's, or he's valuable to me dead. That's when you know you got a relationship with God. You know you have a relationship with God when you know that he is alive and he is working for you. Or when it feels like everything is dead and you don't know where he's at, but you're still seeking after God. You're still pursuing after God. That was the attitude of Mary Magdalene. And because of that, Jesus says to her, Mary. In other words, Mary, what are you doing? I'm in progress here, Mary. I am the perfect sacrifice. When she sees him, she says, Rabboni, Master, it's you. And Jesus says, hey, don't touch me. You can't touch me. And Jesus was saying, you can't touch me because I'm in a state of ultimate perfection. Mary, everything that I've done up to this point, it is to go before my Father and to go before your God. Mary, go back into the upper room. Go back to my brethren and you tell them that you've seen me and that I'm alive. And you've got to understand it's early in the morning. And Jesus wants to go before the throne room of God. 
Jesus wants to present himself before his heavenly father in this bodily form. And so Jesus is ushered before before and through the heavens and he stands before his heavenly father and when he does so we know the sacrifice was absolutely accepted we know that the perfect lamb of God was approved by God and you have to understand Jesus was that perfect sacrifice he was the perfect lamb and so because of that he had perfect blood now the blood wasn't for him the blood was shed that anywhere the blood would be applied, it would identify the recipient as perfect in the sight of God. Glory to God. I said anywhere the blood would be applied, it would identify and deem the recipient perfect before God. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but God has declared the church perfect before God because we are the recipients of the blood of Jesus and you that are watching today you're going to be able to position yourself for the blood you're going to be able to position yourself to experience the blood because God wants to wash away your sins and God wants to bring you in a point of perfection before him not that you're going to be flawless but that you will be faultless. The blood doesn't make you faultless. There is a constant striving and developing, seeking after God, growing in your sanctification, but it does make you faultless before God that when he looks down because of that blood, he sees you and he declares that you are perfect. And because he declares that you are perfect, you can have a perfect relationship with your heavenly father. A perfect relationship. You can't say with too many people you have a perfect relationship with them. You can say I've got a good relationship with my mom, but you don't got a perfect relationship with your mom. You can say I got a good relationship with my kids, but you don't have a perfect relationship with your kids because there's nothing in this life that we can look at and say that's perfect, not even a relationship. But you can look at God and be because of the blood of Jesus and because you are in Jesus you can say I've got a perfect relationship with God because of the perfect sacrifice go ahead and shout amen now I want to look at my text here for a moment this text it, it looms at me so many different things that after Jesus says Mary you know, don't touch me, I'm going up. And he goes up in the morning. The Bible says at evening time. In other words, the duration of time from the morning from when he got up to he went before the heavens and he presented himself at evening time. In other words, Jesus came back to this earth. He comes back with this earth and Jesus comes with good news as the perfect sacrifice of God. He, he was so excited to see his brother and his disciples and his apostles, that he didn't wait to knock on the door and say, hey, Peter, open up the door, let me in. Hey, hey, Mary, make some, it's Jesus, let me in. He didn't wait for any of that. He was so excited, and he had the power. He walked right through that wall. He walked right through the door. Wow. You know how excited Jesus is to have a relationship with you? That he walked through that door symbolizing that he can walk through any barrier. He can walk through any situation that you feel that you are separated from Jesus. He can touch you right where you are at if you would just let him walk in through the barrier. If you would just call upon the name of Jesus. And if you would realize he is the perfect sacrifice. He can walk through the barrier. And when he walked through that barrier, that door, the first thing that he says unto them, he says, peace be unto you. In the Hebrew, he says, shalom be to you guys. They saw him and they were shocked. And the Bible says he was in the midst of them. You see, he was in the center of them. If you're going to walk and live in the peace of God, you've got to make sure that Jesus is in the midst of you, that he is in the center of you. 
He was in the center of them. They were shocked when they saw him. And they were even more shocked when he said shalom to them. Because shalom declares behold. Jesus walks in the midst of them. In the midst of while the Romans were looking with those that ran with Jesus and associated with Jesus. Jesus walks in the midst of them. And he declares, don't look at the hostility. Don't look at what's taking place in the background. Jesus says, I've walked in at the perfect sacrifice. I've been accepted by your heavenly Father. And because I've been accepted, I can come before you right now and tell you peace in the midst of your situation. Now watch this. In order for them to really receive the peace they had to understand the pain. And you see, some of us, we, we are going through a lot of things right now. And there's a lot of just adversity and a lot of hardship that a lot of people are dealing with. But the Apostle Paul declares, I want to know him. Not just in, in the resurrection of his power, but in the fellowship of his suffering. Because if you're really going to know Jesus, if you're really going to be intimate with Jesus, you've got to know him more than just within the resurrection of his power. You've got to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. You've got to go through something. You've got to go through some hardships. You've got to go through some difficulties where you're still looking for him. Where he can walk through the wall and he can come and find you and he can say peace be unto you and then you've got a choice do I look at Jesus or do I look at the storm do I look at Jesus or do I look at the coronavirus do I look at Jesus or do I look at the economy what do I do you look at Jesus you look at Jesus because when he says peace be unto you he's saying wholeness be unto you he is saying nothing missing and nothing broken from your life. And you respond and you say, but Lord, how can there be nothing missing? How can there be nothing broken in my life? The next thing that Jesus says, it says that Jesus shows them his hands. Watch it. Go back with me to uh, John chapter 20. Go with me to verse number 19. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week, Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw him. It wasn't when Jesus spoke the word and said, peace, shalom. It was when Jesus showed them his hands. It's when Jesus showed them his sides. Why? Because Jesus had to show them his pain. When they saw his pain, they were able to receive his presence. And when they were able to receive his presence, they were able to be a recipient of his peace. And I've come today to tell you the perfect sacrifice has been sacrificed already. It's Jesus Christ. And because he is the perfect sacrifice, today he is coming to you. He is coming to you to touch you with his presence. And if you can receive his presence. You can experience his peace. But you can only experience that peace if you understand his pain. The pain that he endured. Oh, we celebrate the resurrection today, but oh, the atrocities that Jesus had to endure on the cross. The atrocity that Jesus had to endure while he was in Gethsemane and how he prayed and how he was up all night and how he was suffering. Oh, he had to endure so much warfare. There was so much pain attached to Jesus. 
And yet, through it all, he remained perfect in the sight of God. Through it all, he, he refused to surrender over to the temptations of the devil. He refused to break the law. He refused to, to abandon his assignment. He was so committed to his assignment. And ladies and gentlemen, he's still committed to that assignment that after he ascended up to heaven, the Bible says, he has sat down in the right hand of power. Power. He is sat down in the right hand of power. He is in a position of authority. And he stands as our great intercessor in prayer. And when we are here on this earth, blood bought and spirit filled, I am telling you, when we begin to call upon the name and when we have understanding of the perfect sacrifice, when we understand what he did, oh, we can become a recipient of it because of what he did. Look with me to Isaiah chapter 55, please. Verse number 1. He said, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that has no money, come ye and buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. I like the way it, it says it in the Amplified. He says, wait and listen, everyone who is thirsty. Come to the water, he who has no money. Come and buy and eat. Yes, come and buy the priceless spiritual wine and milk without money and without price. Simply for the self-surrender that accept the blessings. He says, come. When you realize that you are imperfect, when you realize that you are never going to get yourself right, but you've got to come to the one that has already provided the sacrifice, and you've got to present yourself to him and realize, God, I'm broken, and God, I don't have anything to offer you, and God, I've turned from you, and it's taken this entire pandemic to wake me up, but God, I come to you in my brokenness, and I come to you with a thirsty spirit and I'm needing that new wine I'm needing you to restore my joy I'm needing that milk I'm needing your word I'm needing that direction for my life he says when you come to him and you understand the perfect sacrifice he said you can have all that you want praise God praise God go ahead say praise God praise God hallelujah in Ephesians chapter 1, I want you to see with me at verse number 6, it describes us within the context, the Apostle Paul, he's delineating about Jesus, but he includes us in what Jesus has done. He says in Ephesians 1 verse number 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted into the beloved. Listen to that. To the praise of the glory of His grace. It's the praise of the glory of the grace of God. Well, where do we see the praise of that glory or the manifestation of that glory is that He has accepted us in the beloved. Hallelujah. Jesus is the beloved of God because Jesus was the only one that was perfect. But when we are in Jesus, he says you are accepted in Jesus. That word accepted means you are welcomed. That word accepted means you are welcomed just how Jesus has, is welcomed because the blood has been applied to your life. That perfect sacrifice has been applied to your life. Now you can have a perfect relationship with God. You can move forward and understand that when you begin to pray because of that perfect sacrifice and you begin to invoke the name of Jesus because he gave you the name and you invoke the name, that perfect sacrifice has allowed God to begin to move upon your petitions and more importantly, your declarations. The authority that he has invested. Watch what he says here, verse number 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood. This perfect sacrifice has afforded us redemption. Redemption. 
redemption, this, this Greek word is so, it's so interesting because this Greek, Greek word carries us all the way back unto the Old Testament. Back in the times when there was slavery and people were bound. They were just indentured servants. They would never get out of their slavery. And so what they would do, they would have these auctions and they would call for a slave and the slave would have to go and present themselves on that auction block and they would begin to examine the, the, the servant, the slave, and they, they would look at his teeth. Does he have sound teeth? And they would look and feel his arms. Does he have adequate muscles? Are they going to be able to labor for me? Are they going to be able to be able to serve in, in what I'm going to purchase them for? And if they qualified on the auction block, then what would happen was they would be redeemed. Because redemption means to be purchased from the auction block. And I'm glad today to declare that we were all on the auction block at one time. We were all bound. We were all bound with slavery. But there was a God that looked down and he shed the blood of Jesus. That perfect sacrifice. And because he is that perfect sacrifice, the blood declared, I see that one over there and I want to redeem them or I want to buy them I'm going to purchase them and then when the master looked the master of sin looked and said what value do they have they don't have any muscle density they don't have any ability they're all broken down the blood says I don't care what state they're in I'm willing to purchase them with my blood because once I give them the blood I'm going to turn around and give them the spirit and when I give them the spirit the spirit's going to restore them to the state that they were originally supposed to be in because they're going to be able to have a perfect relationship with God hallelujah go ahead and worship the Lord right there <laughs> hallelujah we thank you for the perfect sacrifice we thank you for the perfect sacrifice you say oh pastor Otano I at times I just I just feel that I make these mistakes and I feel like I'm so far from God. Well, you got to pick yourself back up and you got to. You can't fall into what Isaiah said that my people go into captivity for a lack of knowledge. You can't think because you've made this mistake or you have fallen that God is done with you. I'm here to tell you he's not done with you. That's what the devil would want you to believe that God was done with you. But he is not done done with you if you can get the revelation of what the word declares of him being the perfect sacrifice I'm telling you God will begin to go to fight for you look with me to first John chapter 2 please first John chapter 2 look with me to verse number 1 he says my little children he says my little children because He's actually writing this letter to new converts, people that recently converted, people that were still in development. They were still making mistakes. They were, they were in the process of trying to get stabilized. They were in the process to live this separate holy life unto God. And this is what he says. He says, my little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. You're right if you have the attitude that says, I don't want to sin, and I want to separate myself from sin because sin puts bondage in people. Uh, sin reinforces darkness in a person's life, and, and sin makes a person feel empty, and, and, and sin puts a person in a state where they have absolutely no value. So you don't want to sin. You don't want to say, well, the perfect sacrifice, I can go and sin. No, you can't do that because sin will strip you from your revelation. And sin will put you in a state of darkness. And sin will put chains back on you. So you don't want to sin. But watch what he says. But if you sin, and if any man sin, he says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous Oh, glory to God. He says, he says, little children, I want you to know it is not for you to sin. I don't want you to sin. He says, but if you sin, 
He says, we have an advocate with the Father. The word advocate there comes from a Greek word, parakletes. And it means we've got the defender. we got a defender with the Father that if you commit a sin, the blood goes to work on your behalf. And he's going to begin to defend you. We've got the parakletes. we got someone that's going to plead your case before God. He's going to plead your case through the blood. I said, he's going to plead your case through the blood. The blood is going to speak on your behalf. And when the blood speaks, it's speaking based on that he is a perfect sacrifice. And because we are in him, we can be perfect in our relationship with God. Woo, Jesus. An advocate with the Father. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. I really like to to work on that because that word advocate is where we get the word lawyer. That Jesus is our attorney. And Jesus goes to work for us. That when the enemy tries to hurl all these accusations and said they ain't good enough and they haven't done that. Jesus stands up as your attorney. And he stands up and he begins to clear his voice. And he begins to speak from the perspective of his sacrifice. That the price was already paid. Hebrews chapter number 12. Look at verse number 22 through 24. But you have come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And watch this. And to an innumerable company of angels. Listen, he says, when you came into the kingdom of God, when the blood was applied to your life and the spirit was loose upon you, he says, you have come to the heavenly Jerusalem where there is an innumerable company of angels. Not only is the blood fighting for you, not only has the blood covered you not only has the blood redeemed you but because of that blood that has been applied to you there are angels that recognize you and they are they are in your life they've been assigned to you they've been assigned to protect you they've been assigned to reinforce what the blood has accomplished for you watch what he says to the general assembly and to the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven And to God, watch this, the judge of all, and to the spirit of just men made perfect. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. Who are are the just men? The ones in which the blood has been applied to. That when that blood was applied to you, the Bible says that you are now just and you have been made perfect in the sight of God. Mm -mm -mm. you have made been made perfect look to your family member and tell them right now and say you have been made perfect now look at the family member that gets on your nerves and tell them God's still working on you you have been made perfect perfect but some of you are still a project in development glory to God watch what he goes on and says here look at verse number 24 And to Jesus, watch this, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh, watch this, better thing than that of Abel. Hmm. Jesus is the mediator between the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling, that blood that was shed that speaks better than the blood of Abel. He's saying that the blood of Jesus speaks better than the blood of Abel. After Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they had two children. They had one son by the name of Cain. They had another son by the name of Abel. These were the first two offsprings that were born into sin. And the Bible says that Adam, it implies that Adam instructed them how to have a relationship with God, that you had to build an altar, and after you built an altar, you got to sacrifice a lamb at that altar. And when you sacrifice the lamb, the lamb will cause you to be accepted 
in the sight of God, but you have to do this annually before God. And so what ended up happening was that because Abel was a sheep herder, he brought a sheep. He brought God the best sheep. And when he did so, the Bible says God had respect unto Abel's sacrifice. And it came before the Lord as a sweet fragrance. But Cain, who was a sheep, wasn't a sheep herder. He was a farmer. Cain came and he got the best fruit that he had. He built an altar. He, he presented that fruit and, and lit that fruit before God. And when it came before God, it was offensive unto God. It was offensive unto God because Cain was trying to be self-sufficient. Cain was implying, God, I know you want me to bring you a lamb, but I want to be more self-sufficient. I'm going to exercise what I have to offer you. I'm a farmer, so I'm going to give you what I have. It's implying a sense of self-sufficiency. It's implying a sense of performance. So Cain comes before God, and he tries to qualify himself before God. He's striving to justify himself before God. Let me offer you this sacrifice. But you see, he didn't understand that the lamb in the garden and the lamb in the Old Testament was pointing to the lamb of the New Testament. He didn't understand that God was the one that provided the instructions of how we would come before him. And that's important for us to understand because you just can't come to God anyway. You just can't give God whatever it is that you're wanting to give God. You can't just say, well, I'm not going to repent myself and I'm just going to offer God some of my good works and I'm going to do what I think is, is sufficient in my own eyes. That's an attitude of Cain. And if you come that way, the sacrifice cannot be accepted it has to come where there is a lamb that's presented and the lamb has already been presented you don't have to sacrifice the lamb today what you need to do you need to receive the lamb today and if you can receive the lamb today then you can make preparation to apply the blood of the lamb in your life and if you get the blood he'll give you his spirit Say amen to that. But what ends up happening is that uh, Cain gets jealous with Abel. He gets jealous uh, because Abel's sacrifice was accepted. And so what he does, he goes and has a meeting with him in the field. And he, he meets him. He begins to talk with him. And Abel begins to tell him, hey, just do what dad taught us to do. Offer up the lamb. And he gets upset because his brother is not acquiescing to his requests. And so anger rises up and he picks up a stone and he crushes the head of his brother and he kills his brother right there. And when he shed the blood of his brother, and as that, bl that blood was moving and it was going through the earth, that blood was speaking before the presence of God. Go with me to Genesis chapter number four, please. Come on, track with me here. God's speaking to us. Genesis chapter number 4, please. Uh, I want you to see with me verse number 3, beginning at verse number 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel's offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. He lost his attitude. See, there's an element of pride there and rebellion there that needed to be broken from his life. Watch what he goes on and says, verse number five, uh, verse number six. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, watch what he said. Sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire. 
and thou shalt rule over him. Now I want to read to you verse number 7 from the Amplified because God will say, listen, if you would do right, if you would just accept the Lamb, if you would recognize a perfect sacrifice and surrender your life over to him, he's saying you'd be accepted. But he lost his countenance and he said, and if you don't do it that way, if you don't follow my plan and you do what you're wanting to do independently, he said sin is going to lie at the door of your life. In other words, there's going to be an open door in the spirit and because of that open door in the spirit, sin is going to be able to come into your life and sin's going to be able to control you. Watch what he says in verse number seven. For if you do well, you will if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, watch this. Sin crouches at your door, and its desire is for you. But you must master it. He says, if you don't do what's right, and you don't follow after the perfect sacrifice, he says, you're going to open up a door, and sin has got a desire, and sin's desire, it wants to control you. But he says, you've got to master the sin. Well, how do I master the sin? You bring the sin to the perfect sacrifice. And when you bring sin to the perfect sacrifice, the blood will speak on your behalf. No matter what it is, no matter what has happened, God can restore your life through his perfect sacrifice. I'm getting ready to close. I don't feel like I got started, but I'm getting ready to close here. I want you to see verse chapter number 4, verse number 10 through 12. You've got to hear this here. He says, and he said, what, shall th what hast thou done? This is God's having a conversation with Cain, holding him accountable for shedding the blood of his brother. He said, what hast thou done? Watch this. The voice of thy brother brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. He says, I know what you've done because blood has been shed and that blood that has been shed has a voice. The voice is speaking through the blood and that voice is crying out before me. Now the blood of Abel was crying out for justice because uh, Abel was unjustly murdered by his brother. So that blood was crying out for justice. And God heard that voice. And God came and he came to Abel. And it doesn't, the word voice here in Greek is coal in Greek. And it's more than just an utterance. It's not, God is not saying that the voice of your brother came to me was just an utterance. He's saying it's cold in Greek. He says the voice, your brother's blood is yelling before my throne. Your brother's blood is coming before my throne. It's yelling for justice. And the scripture says that the blood of Jesus speaks that better than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood cries out and says justice, but Jesus' blood cries out and says justified. Justified because of the blood of Jesus. Justified because of the perfect sacrifice. And when you have that perfect sacrifice, and you can have it today, all you've got to do is surrender your heart unto the Lord Jesus Christ. All you've got to do is ask God to forgive you of your sins. And if you ask God to forgive you of your sins, God will hear you, and God will forgive you. And when you put your faith in Jesus, you surrender over to His plan. Because it's not going to be very long until we're going to be able to assemble together. And as we pray here this afternoon, as we pray here tonight, we recognize the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb, what has been offered. As we recognize this sacrifice, as we yield to the sacrifice, the blood is going to start to move. And then when you come, you can show the obedience of your faith. We'll take you down in the beautiful name of Jesus.
But I'm here to tell you, as you call upon that perfect sacrifice, the Spirit of God will meet you right where you are at. He will fill you with His Spirit. There is nothing that can stop it. Because Jesus sits in the position of authority even right now. The other day, my daughter Celeste pointed out to me this flower that we had on, on the counter. We had some people come over and they brought this beautiful flower. I think it's a blue star, something like that. And we had it on the counter. And it was interesting because during the day, the flowers were leaning towards the window where the sunlight was coming in. It was leaning towards the window because it was after the light. But at nighttime, the flowers were literally changed position and it was leaning towards the light in the kitchen. Because the flowers wanted to live, the flowers were leaning into the light. I ask you today, do you want to live in Jesus? You got to lean into the light. If you lean into the light this afternoon by calling on the name of Jesus, I promise you that that light will come with new life. And it will restore you in your brokenness. It will heal you in your confusion. It will restore your life how God originally designed for it to be. You're not designed to live in fear or in anxiety. There is a perfect sacrifice. Close your eyes right now. I want to pray together right now. Lord Jesus. We receive this word this afternoon. We thank you, God, for this word that's brought our attention to the perfect sacrifice that took place 2,000 years ago. The perfect sacrifice whose blood speaks better than the blood of Abel. Right now, Jesus, we worship you. We worship you with all of our hearts. We worship you. And we're asking God that you would forgive us of all of our sins right now in our living room, right now in our kitchen this Easter Sunday. We're asking for your forgiveness. We turn to the perfect sacrifice. We surrender our lives over to you. Oh, we thank you for it. We thank you for it. We thank you for the perfect sacrifice. We receive it right now. Oh, we receive it right now. Come on, saints of God. Come on, church. Right now in your living room, just continue to worship for just a moment. This is a celebration. This is Resurrection Sunday. God, we thank you for the perfect sacrifice that's changed and transformed our lives. We adore you and we exalt you in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Heal that broken heart, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. Lift off of them the anxiety that they have been under in the name of Jesus. I break the chains of bondage that tells them they cannot change because of the blood and the perfect sacrifice. You can't change in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Clap your hands unto Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah, thank you God. Glory be to your name, glory be to your name. What an incredible service we have shared in. What a time we have had together worshiping 
the King of glory, celebrating the Word, recognizing the revelation of the perfect sacrifice. I'm going to continue to, to stay in this series. This is just the first installment. Oh, we're going to be talking about this thing here because God is doing a work in your life. And listen, today if you've repented of your sins, if you surrendered your life to Jesus, I want you to celebrate that. I want you to make remarks right there. Make comments right there. If you're wanting to be water baptized in the name of Jesus, go ahead and make comments there. Lee, inbox us. Eventually, we're going to come together here shortly. We're going to make that possible. And we're so grateful for you to tune in today with us. Before we conclude, because this is Resurrection Sunday, today represents the Passover. And the Bible teaches us about a special offering, an offering that honors the Passover or the resurrection. Today, I'm asking you to sow your best seed in support of the resurrection. A seed in the Bible represents a future. It's interesting because the first prophecy of Jesus is found in Genesis 3.15. Well, the Bible says that his seed was going to crush the head of the serpent. And I want us to consider that today as we prepare to give the best offering Passover offering that we can give. And you can do that by going to our website. You can go to ChristianRevivalCenter.org. You can go there at the giving icon there. And you can go ahead and do that. And, and electronically there, it is very secure. It's very safe. You're going to help us to continue to move forward and do what we're called to do. And, and reach the world with this message. I want to thank you even beforehand. Because I know that there's giving hearts that are watching right now. Jesus can't touch our heart with this love. And us not want to give back something to him. I thank you for that. If you would like to mail the offering in. You can do that by going to uh, Christian Revival Center. 805 West 57th Avenue. Maryville, Indiana. 46410. You can mail that in if you'd like to do it that way. Thank you for being with us and celebrating Resurrection Sunday. I want you to remember we love you in Jesus.